Welcome to the Truth and Reason page. We are a Christian organization, and I believe a Christian has only one mission, and that is the Great Commission. We have been commissioned to make disciples out of all nations, and that is what we are here to do, to introduce you to theology, apologetics, and all the controversial questions of life and involving faith. Kindly subscribe to our pages and follow us on this wonderful journey. God bless you. I have a question for Christians. Honest question for Christians. I don't mean any harm. I don't mean anything. It's just a question. Why would God kill his son for our sins? How will a loving, merciful God crucify his own son? And not just forgive us all for our sins and have to kill the person he loves the most in order to forgive us. And if all the wages of sin is death, whatever sin, according to Paul, or is it Romans 6, 23, why don't we all die after sinning to God? And if that is so, and Jesus died for our sins, why do people still commit atrocities? And if if, if God wanted, he could have just forgiven us all, just like Jesus thought about the um, case of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, where the son came back and the father welcomed him, um, with, um, welcomed him back with open arms and everything was okay. I mean, nobody has to die for somebody to be forgiven, right? And if God is truly a merciful God, and someone has to die, then is there even forgiveness? And speaking logically, as a father, if one of your children sinned to you, would you kill the other one so that the other one would be forgiven? And if all this is to protect us, right, who is supposed to protect us? The child of God or God? I mean, it's God himself, right? And some pastors even say that God came down himself and is the mystery of Trinity, and I thought that's even more absurd because at least if the son died, we still have the father. But if the father came down himself, then God died. Who is going to run the world? All right. So welcome, wonderful people. Today I'm going to be reacting to a video. And uh, the video, a lady asked a couple of questions. And I'm going to try my hands on them. And hopefully I do a sweet job with that. So it's more like a response type of video. All right. So she asked. The first question is, why would a merciful God kill his son so that he could forgive others? Why not just kill? Why not just forgive? Pardon me. Why not just forgive uh, us without killing the one whom he loves? Now, this question supposes that uh, the death of Christ was a form of cosmic child abuse, you know. Like, God just picks up Christ and starts to spank him in a sense for the wrongs of another and for just no reasons like I like these guys too so because I want to forgive them I'm going to beat you so that I, I'll, I'll, I'll spend my rage on you so that I don't put it on them which is a wrong notion so the, the death of Christ is not some form of, of, of some cosmic child abuse right you read John 10 17 Christ talks about how Nobody takes his life on him, but he lays his life down willingly. So the death of Christ was a was a willing act of Christ, not uh, a forceful thing or an imposed thing on him. The question goes on to say, why doesn't God just forgive sin? And the simple answer is why: well, because God is righteous. Righteousness demands that justice be met. So if the soul that sins must surely die, according to Ezekiel eighteen verse twenty then everyone who sins has to die. There has to be a penalty for sin. So God cannot just arbitrarily forgive sin because the soul that sin has to die. That is the necessary requirement of justice. And God being a righteous God cannot flout that. We obviously God is merciful. God is love and all that. So why not just forgive? No. He's also righteous. And if he forgives without a necessary punishment, then God will end up being unjust which is against the nature of righteousness. I hope you understand it. So why doesn't God just forgive? Because he is righteous. All right. So in addition to his justice, righteousness and justice, that is where love and mercy comes to. And see, because God was God is righteous and he has to punish sin, he, he, it's up, because God is righteous and has to punish sin, but yet he's equally loving and merciful that he doesn't want to punish us humans for it. He instituted a, a type, you know, something to stand in the gap until the perfect sacrifice was made. 
and that is the Old Testament, the sacrifice of bulls and rams. So when you read from Leviticus 10 or Leviticus 17 verse 11, I believe, and Hebrews 9, 22, it talks about how uh, the, the blood of bulls are being given for the remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's the remission of sin. So, and these things have been given, were given as a type, as a way to, to temper the justice of God for a while before the actual price was paid. You know, so sort of an installment, you know, little by little. So just so that humans don't have to actually pay for their, 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 their sin, you know, by themselves, which in a sense, and we are unworthy sacrifices. You understand? But God has to temper that with some bit of installment, payment in installments, payments and installments till the actual payment which is manifested in Christ. All right. So the love and mercy of God required that God find a replacement for mankind. And he did that initially with the with the offering of bulls and rams. And bit by bit. But unfortunately you find in Hebrews ten verse one to four I believe that it says that the sacrifice of bulls and rams were not enough. Were not sacrificed enough for for the penalty. And God being a just God has to pay the full price of of our sin. Do you understand? So what then does he do? He gives a son who also offers himself willingly. You know. And the 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 aim of it is that he's able, he's a worthy sacrifice to pay for the sin of all mankind and he still maintain his life. Never look at the, the death of Christ without the, the the resurrection of Christ in view. It wasn't a sacrifice in loss because he was going to be resurrected at the end of at the end of three days. You understand? So it was never going to be a sacrifice in loss. So God gave Christ in hope that Christ would pay for our sins and be resurrected on the third day. Gaining many more sons who us having already paid for our sins. I hope, I hope it is clear. So the death of God couldn't just forgive sin because he is just and righteous. Then how, how does he do that? By not also punishing us. By his love and his mercy. When he institutes the sacrifice of both the rams in place of, of us human beings for a while until the coming of Christ. So when John sees Christ coming, he says... Here comes, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So John understands that Christ is the the ultimate sacrifice for mankind and 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 God sacrifices him willingly with him also willingly sacrificing himself to 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 pay for our sin, therefore satisfying the righteousness and justice of God and also satisfying the love and mercy of God. I hope it is clear. And the next question is, if the wages of sin is death, why don't we all die after sinning? The truth is, we all die after sinning, but it depends on how you are defining the concept of death after sin. So let me explain. Um, the concept of dying after sin doesn't start in Romans, as you quote, but it starts in Genesis, in the, the garden, where God tells the first man and the woman that, uh, and the day that you sin, you will die. But we all read from the story that the day that they eat of that fruit, they don't fall down and die per se. So what is the answer for that? The answer then, as we de- as we define classically as death, the death meaning a separation from God. So the day that they sin, they were separated from God. There was a distance between them and God. All right. So and it's evident in, in all our religious activities of the unsaved man to reach God. So man has always tried to find, man has always been a religious being. So we always try and find a way to make contact with God. And it's that he says that there's a separation from from God. And unfortunately, our efforts cannot do so. Yes, truly, whenever we sin, we die. And if that there is a gradual separation from God, and assuming we sin every day, there's a daily death and a daily separation which culminates in, uh, um, um, an eternal death, which is known to be hell, which is an eternal separation from God. So yes, we truly die, but depending on your definition of death or how you are thinking death, you mean that you should fall down and die immediately. You could fall down and die depending on whatever sin you are committing. You know, imagine you are stealing and you are being chased or you you are found out and there's a mob that lynches you to death. 
that death was as a consequence of your sin. So there are some things that you could do that actually end you in in immediate death. But that's just by the way. But the truth is, whenever we truly sin, we die. And that is why we need to give our life to Christ. Because the verse you quote, I believe Romans 6, 23, said, but the, the ways of sin and death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That is the that is a distinction. That is why we all need to be saved. When you put your faith in Christ, that separation, that gap is bridged. And there's no need for any form of religious, you know, up and downs and all of those things. Kula Palu, I should say, or religious maneuvers to try and bridge that gap. The only way to bridge it is by faith in Christ. So the gift of God which comes by faith in Christ bridges us back to God, brings us back to God into into a relationship with him so we no longer have to die but the unsaved man surely is dead after sin he goes on to ask another question and that if jesus died for our sin why why is there self sin why do people still commit atrocities and the simple answer is, is free will people are allowed to do what they want to do we are not automatons as c.s lewis will say we are not machines we are made to express our will and to do what we want to do. And it's made evident in the opening chapters of the Bible, where the first man is given is given a choice to choose what he wants to do. And he's be, he has be, was successfully deceived and convinced to choose something otherwise than what God had told him not to do. Okay, so the first thing is true. People are allowed to do, to do what they want to do. And mostly that free will is rooted in people not being seen. So it is guided by the unseen nature of men. You know, we believe through in Christianity that there's a, the fallenness of man. Man has tends towards evil often as a natural man. So it, it is obvious, quite obvious that an unseen man will, will do every evil thing as long as his, his, his nature permits him or his, his abilities permit him. Because he's living basically on animalistic instinct. I feel like doing then I should do so. The will of men being guided by their atomic nature and their fallen nature definitely will lead to to so many atrocities in, in the world. And oftentimes peop, some of the greatest atrocities that have been committed. I'm going off the word she used, the word being atrocities. And if you say atrocities, many of the atrocities that have been committed in the world have been committed by godless men. They start on the premise of there being no God and them being the law. So they act anyhow they want to, to act. Okay, but some will also say, oh, many Christians have done many evil things and all that. I agree, and it's that many, some Christians are bad Christians. So that that's a given that they are going to act anyhow they want to act, you know. And it's that some people who proclaim to be Christians are not Christians. That also is another reason why. And let me tell you another reason will be how people have lived all their lives. So you find someone who has lived doing all these bad things all their lives. It becomes hard if they are not really coached and helped and discipled really well to immediately stop certain bad habits. So I understand that it's possible that many people can find themselves in that place where they have to train themselves out of certain bad habits. But I doubt the world is, is suffering from Christians acting wrongly. No, I doubt that the world is suffering from Christians acting badly. If not for anything, I believe the world is a better place because they are Christians uh, who are actually practicing their faith because, because what they believe actually uh, tempers down their uh, animalistic instincts and, 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 and their flesh and makes us live in a certain way. So I doubt that the world is suffering from Christians, but definitely from many unsaved men and, and, and unregenerated men. They are free to do what they want to do. So, I, I think it has nothing to do with whether Christ died or not. But for those who believe in the death of Christ, their lives are being changed. But for those who do not believe in it, definitely they are going to do what they want to do. But she asked another question, which is, um, why didn't God just forgive? You know, and she quotes references the story of the prodigal son. It's like no one has to die for someone else, and that's what she says. God could just forgive, and. My simple answer is, as I've already dealt, is the righteousness of God. For God to forgive without actually punishing sin will be an unjust act. God, Genesis 18 says that will the judge of all the earth not do 
right? So God of necessity, because of his nature as a righteous, that has to do the right thing and that the soul that sin, sins must die. So all men deserve death. So it, it's always counterintuitive that we are not we have not paid the price of death for our sin. I don't know if you understand it. So it, it, it is it is almost a, a miracle. It is a miracle that someone else had to die for us because n- normally and legally we are the ones supposed to die and we didn't die. So it, it, it is actually that God had to go out of His way to make sure that we didn't die. And also in the case of parables, you know. Uh, to interpret a, a parable, you have to be very careful. Parables seek to to communicate a certain truth. So, so if you try to find specific details and, and over analyze it, you may end up in error. A clear example is when he likens uh, himself, Jesus likens himself to, uh, or, or gives the parable of if someone had a hundred sheep and and one was lost, doesn't he leave the ninety the, the one for the ninety nine? Now, I go to tell him that Jesus has only 100 sheep. No. The truth is trying to communicate is that one sheep is valuable. Whatever the sheep or whoever the sheep is, and he will go out of his way to to save that one. So it's not about the number. It's not about the type of sheep. It's just about the fact that you and I are precious on the side that you do everything to save us. Equally, the parable of the the... The prodigal son is to say that God is willing to walk among us with open arms as long as we are willing to come back to him and admit that we have we have erred in our ways. So it has nothing to do with the picture of the cross not being in the story of the, the prodigal son, but it has everything to do with God's ability to forgive us and accept us no matter whatever we have done. Next one is if God is truly merciful, and someone has to die for us, and doesn't make the forgiveness really forgiveness. And technically, yes, it, it actually makes it true forgiveness. Because if we are looking at it at, as an emotional thing, we might fall into the mistake you are falling or this lady fell, fell into. But we have to look at it as a legal issue. You can't just walk into court if I've done something as you, someone, person A has committed a crime. And as a just judge sitting in court, I tell them, go, I've forgiven you, just walk out. It would be unheard of. I would have broken every law in the book. It is not legal to do that. I might be merciful, but I would be unjust to just let the person go. The only way for that person to escape is that the price be paid. You understand? So the magic in, in that courtroom would be me finding a suitable replacement for that person to pay the price so that that person could escape. So actually, that is true forgiveness. If you look at it as a legal issue, the death, the, res- the resurrection of Christ, the death of Christ on the cross for our sins, it's not simply an emotional issue. It's not something that uh, your sibling offends you and you're like, okay, I forgive you. Just just go away from my side, I forgive you. But no, it's not, it's not emotional. It's a legal thing. So consider yourself as standing in court, in God's court, and God has to punish you. Uh, but he's also merciful and he wants to forgive you. For him to let you walk away unpunished without some without the price being paid will be unjust of him. And it can never be said that God God was unjust. So what, what does he have to do? He has to find a worthy replacement for you so that you can walk away scot free. And then he would have achieved both mercy, love. He would achieve both mercy and justice. I hope you understand. So yes. If someone had to pay that price, that is true forgiveness because God had both satisfied justice and his mercy. All right. My last question centers on the the triunity of God or the trinity of God. And is that, is it the father himself who, who came to earth? And if it is the father, then was heaven left vacant? <laughs> <laughs>